All right, didn't get emailed any questions advanced, although I do have a question in the chat. Um, are the Argo 2 exam grades up? How did we do overall? So yes, I actually got all of the exams back yesterday, I graded them. As of this morning, they should all be posted. In terms of how they did overall, well, overall, not very well. I was kind of surprised at how low the grades were on this exam. Um, it was kind of odd because a lot of the questions that were on this exam were really reflective of what was, a lot of the questions I saw missed a lot were actually covered in discussion boards. So there was one that asked, which of these is aromatic? And people consistently missed the correct answer, which I thought was kind of odd because, um, like some of the most commonly picked ones were like really clearly not correct answers. Um, particularly with the back end synthesis problems, a lot of those synthesis problems were really reflective of what was covered in the discussion board. So I was kind of surprised to see that a lot of people didn't get the synthesis right. Particularly the last one, which because that's really kind of like examples of homework. You had a lot of homework problems that were like that. You had in the packets a lot of examples of those types of syntheses. I did have a few people try the extra credit one. Um, a couple of them, three people tried um, the second synthesis, the advanced synthesis one with extra credit. I don't think I had anyone get it right, but I definitely saw like good first starts in terms of recognizing that it was a friedel crafts um, acylation, and then there was just another step to kind of get those carbonyls off to finish off the final product. So overall, I'm not sure why the scores were as low as they were. I think the average clocked in about a 65, um, but I think it's people are going to have to get the exams back and see what they think they missed, where they think their confidence was and to kind of reassess their study strategies. This course, especially Orgo 2, I think gets easier as you go along. Um, but that said, you still got to get through the second and third test, which the aldehydes and ketones and the enol enolate sections tend to be a bit more intense just because the reactions are more complicated. Oh, the um, there was one synthesis I was surprised. Um, it was the second, it was the first question where it was kind of like the fill in the blanks of the synthesis and people were giving some really strange answers. Um, a lot of people are trying to make ethers with what they were given, and kind of the rule with these exams is that if it's a super complicated compound to name, or it's a functional group we haven't had to name before, you probably aren't doing the synthesis right. In fact, I accepted there was the correct answer, which no one got for the first part, but I, I didn't mark you wrong if you didn't get it, I, because there was, if you, when we get it back, we'll talk about it. I want a recording of like what this question was, but... There was actually, if you looked at it, there was a second reaction that should have gone on, but if you didn't catch the second reaction, it holds against you because you weren't technically wrong for the product that came out. But yeah, I definitely got some weird ones. I saw people giving me carbon with like five bonds around it, which it can't do. So again, I would recommend students when they get the exams back over the next week. Um, Wednesday, I'm going to bring you back your exams. So tomorrow's lab, you're going to give back the exams. If you come to the, if you're in the Monday chemistry lab, organic lab, and you want to come by Wednesday and pick it up, you're free to do so. I'm just going to have all the exams with me anyway. Acid catalyzed Williamson and acid catalyzed afterwards, yes. But yeah, I would highly recommend go through the exams, see what you missed, see why you put the answer you put, and especially if you were high confidence on that, um, figure out like what the misunderstanding was. And, and then I would also go back and I would look at the discussion boards, the homework, the study packets, and the notes, and see how the test connects to those. So for the next exam, you have a better feeling as to where things are going to be. Um, Titrometric determination of iron lab. So let me get through acid catalyzed Williamson ether synthesis first, then we'll go to the iron titration lab. So in terms of acid catalyzed versus William ether, Williamson ether synthesis, there's one pen. So acid catalyzed is going to follow, um, we have an ROH, preferably symmetric, and we're gonna work under concentrated sulfur acidic conditions, usually H2SO4, good high concentration to basically, because it's a reversal reaction, go to the ROR plus H2O. This is really good for symmetric ether synthesis, and in general, this is what's used for all ether synthesis. The one thing we don't really wanna do with this acid catalyzed ether synthesis is run this with a bunch of primary alcohols because we may be inclined to get um, rearrangements. But generally speaking, even in Orgo 2, we do synthesis of n-butyl ether and we don't have issues um, with forming anything other than the n-butyl ether. So the acid catalyzed here, you introduce an acid source under low water concentrations and this is how you get ether synthesis. But again, if you work with something like ethanol and methanol, 
because of this, you're going to get symmetric and asymmetric ethers if you have a mixture of ethers. Now, the Williamson ether synthesis, it is kind of a novelty synthesis, I would argue. Where are you? There you are. And I argue it's kind of a novelty because it requires two things that we typically don't want to deal with in practice. So the Williamson ether synthesis is nice in that it is asymmetric. It guarantees, it guarantees us high selectivity for an asymmetric ether, which is what it's used for. The downside with the Williamson ether synthesis is that it requires sodium metal, which is super expensive, and it requires a halogen, which can create issues in terms of like um, reactor conditions. But what you do with the William ether Williamson ether synthesis is we have an alkyl halide, and we have our alcohol, and we're going to introduce sodium metal in here to give us the alkoxide, so this is really R prime minus. And through an SN2 pathway, we end up generating our asymmetric ether. So yes, um, acid catalyzed works for those that are asymmetrical. And typically what we do with those is that we'll run the, because typically with the asymmetric, we have radically different boiling points for the different ethers. We'll distill out the undesired ethers and feed them back into the reactor. So let's say you want to make ethyl methyl ether. And so what you're going to do is you're going to feed ethanol and methanol into the reactor. So we have OH and branch OH. And when we run this acid catalyzed reaction, what we're going to end up generating is a mixture of ethers. So we have the diethyl, the dimethyl, and the ethyl methyl. And then we'll run this through a distillation column. And for the distillation column, we'll redeposit the dimethyl ether and we'll deposit the diethyl ether back into our starting reactor because these are reversible reactions. We can make this uh, acid catalyzed ether go back and forth, and then we take we isolate the diethyl ether or the methyl ethyl ether, which is what we want. So actually, acid catalyzed is pretty much all I've been able to find in the literature in terms of what people do in practice. Because even though the acid catalyzed is not selective, meaning that if you do asymmetric ethers, you'll get a mixture of ethers. It's really cheap to distill it and send it back into the reactor and basically decompose those ethers back into their starting alcohols and run the reaction again. It's a lot easier to do that than trying to take sodium and a halogen and you basically deal with that. Now for the Williamson ether synthesis, this alcohol halide needs to be the bulkier. And the reason we want to do this is the bulkier is that this is more inclined to do an SN2 or a uh, SN2. It's, um, yeah, so if we get any type of uh, um, attack, oh, I don't want to say this. We don't want this to be bulky because something like tert butoxide is going to favor elimination. So actually we want the less bulky to be the alcohol. So the prime, particularly if it's a primary, we want to use our primary as the one that we're making into the alkoxide. If we make this tert butoxide, it's far more, far more favorable to do elimination than it is to do substitution. So technically, um, Williamson ether synthesis is the most selective for doing asymmetric ether synthesis because you control, basically you form an alkoxide that can only react with an alkyl halide. Now, in practice, so the textbook is going to say that the acid catalyzed ether synthesis is less selective. That statement is true, but it's not all about selectivity. So let's compare the two reactions. So, and we'll use a real example. So let's say we want to use, let's say what we ultimately want to make is ethyl, methyl, ethyl, ethyl, methyl ether, uh, methyl, ethyl ether. So we want to make this asymmetric ether. And there's two ways we can do this. So one is the Williamson ether synthesis. And what we'll do is we'll take ethanol and we'll react it with sodium to give us sodium ethoxide. And we'll work with methyl bromide. And this will undergo an SN2 reaction to give us the ethyl methyl ether. So this is selective in the sense that this is pretty much the only product we produce because this ethoxide can't do elimination on the methyl bromide. And what we're going to finish with when we get done is sodium bromide, which is easily isolated, and this ethyl methyl ether. 
Here's the problem, is that sodium metal is not cheap. So you have to, you, to make sodium, you either have to reduce it in hydrogen or you have to use electrolysis. And this is a very high energy demand to make these types of things happen. And sodium is also water sensitive. So if we run this reaction, we have to run, we have to run it under what's called NEAT or um, anhydrous conditions. So ethanol soaks up water. And so we'd have to have 200% ethanol. So we'd have to do a purification step to make that happen. And also your methyl bromide here is pretty toxic. Your other option is to do an acid catalyzed synthesis. So in this case, we have ethanol and methanol, and we'll re react it under acidic conditions. And we will produce a series of symmetric and asymmetric ethers. So in this sense, we lose selectivity. We're going to get a mixture of these three. But here's the thing. This is, I mean, technically toxic, but it's grain alcohol. You can drink it. Just don't drink high quantities of it. And methanol will make you go blind, but if you drink a lot of ethanol, it offsets the methanol. So the methanol ethanol here are actually, and here you can be working with ethanol that contains water. That's fine, as long as it's like a low amount. So we can easily achieve this through distillation. This way we'd have to purify the ethanol to high purities. This is a lot more challenging than it sounds in order to use the sodium. Now you would sit back, the book's going to argue that this is more selective. And so all thing, if production is not an issue, meaning the cost of the reagents doesn't matter, this is the better reaction to run because it guarantees you 100% yield of the product you're looking at. But do we write all the products in? So for the acid, do we write all the products in? Yes. And so typically what happens with acid catalyzed ether synthesis is you get a mixture when you're done. Now, What's really easy to do with ethers is distill them because these all weigh different amounts, which means they're all going to distill at radically different temperatures. So what we can do is keep in mind, this is a reversible reaction, is we can distill this and we can feed the diethyl and the dimethyl ethers back into this reaction mixture with acid. And this is a reversible reaction. They're making and breaking bonds with each other all the time. So if we feed these back through we're going to get another mixture that looks like this. And we pull off the ether we want. We leave the diethyl and dimethyl in there, feed it back with more acid. And so even though this is less selective, the separation and reprocessing the raw materials is a lot easier to do than this. Once we've used up the sodium here, we don't get to use it again without doing electrolysis or some type of really aggressive uh, reduction step. Here, distillation is pretty easy to do. You do it in the lab. And recycling is really easy to do. It's just a pipeline that feeds back into the original reactor. So what you're seeing here is a difference between um, lab scale versus industrial scale. If you absolutely want to have a very high purity asymmetric ether, the Williamson ethers and synthesis is the way to go because there's no back end purification stuff. This is what we produce. The trade off here is that you're working with a toxic compound and you're having to do you're probably one of your alcohols underneath very clean conditions with sodium metal, which is flammable. But you're only doing small scale. Now, on small scale, this distillation reprocessing isn't necessarily practical because you'd have to set up a distillation column, isolate your components, feed them back in, and do this all manually. So at the lab scale, this is the better way to do it. On the industrial scale, though, this is the better way to do it because on the industrial scale, you can set up continuous distillation apparatuses that feed their way back. Um, yes, there is no majority product. You get a mixture, you get a thermodynamic mixture of all three. So that again is a trade off with the acid catalyzed synthesis. On the lab scale, conservatively, let's say all things being equal, one third of your final product, 33% yield is the alcohol, is the ether you're trying to isolate, and you're going to have to distill it to get it back out. So on a lab scale, this isn't practical. So this would be the better way to go. But again, in terms of like industrial scale, there are tricks we can't use on the industrial scale that we can use on the lab scale and vice versa. On the lab scale, so a big example of this is recrystallization. So we talk about recrystallization as a lab you did in 251. It's great. It sounds great. Industrially, it's super hard to do because cooling something down like that is not as easy as it sounds. Cooling down a little beaker, you're talking about maybe, what, five centimeters of width to cool down. Now, now cool down a tank that's 20 meters wide. Okay, you're going to see the temperature profile move across it, and as it forms a solid, it's going to conduct heat worse and worse. So to recrystallize industrially, you're usually having to drop an immersion cooler in there, 
Now your crystals are stuck to the immersion cooler and you have to get them off. So on the lab scale, we recrystallize without any problems. Industrially, we never recrystallize because it's super hard to do it and it's super hard to extract out those crystals. We also won't, don't want to do filtration because filtration, you're going to jam the filters over time. They're going to get saturated and that's a materials cost. You're going to lose stuff to um, fil filtering. But we do it on the bench scale all the time because the industrial equivalent of that does not scale very well to tiny scales. So yeah, I realize it was probably a lot more information than what you were hoping to get out of that. But again, it depends on context. Um, the Williamson Etherosynthesis works great on the lab scale because it's more selective and we don't have usually a big distillation apparatus at our disposal to run to separate the mixture that we would get off an acid catalyzed synthesis. So yes, on the bench scale, probably William, Williamson Etherosynthesis is better. Industrially, we would never do a Williamson Etherosynthesis. It's way too expensive. Whereas your acid catalyzed, while it has like really poor selectivity, the cost to separate is a lot lower than the cost of producing the sodium and the anhydrous conditions we need to run the uh, Williamson ether synthesis. And this is actually my background. This is the chemical engineering background showing up. And an engineer is going to tell you, it depends on what you're doing. The best synthesis depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you need to make 50 milliliters in a lab, go do the Williamson ether synthesis. If you need to make 500 gallons a day, go do your acid catalyzed ether synthesis. All right, um, what were the questions about the titrometric determination of iron? For primary, would there be a case for working the second? Probably, um, depends on what you're trying to make. Usually ethers are used as solvents. And so a secondary ether So diisopropyl alcohol, diisopropyl ether. It depends on what you're trying to go with. Um, a hidden thing we don't talk about a lot with ethers, they're notorious peroxide makers. So peroxide, um, O2 minus, has a habit of exploding. So what ethers will begin to do over time is they will actually begin to form O2 complexes, peroxide complexes. And so there are a few common ethers that are used. Um, Every bottle of ether, when you see it in the lab, actually has an expiration date to let you know when the peroxide concentration is probably getting a bit too high. But in terms of like mass scale ether productions, they're also pretty benign molecules, which is why we use them as solvents. So, yeah, there's probably reasons why people use like secondary and tertiary ethers. But the truth is, ethers are typically only used as solvents. They're not really used as reagents for something else. And we don't we have a few that we like to work with diethyl ether dimethyl ether uh, methyl terp butyl ether are three very common ethers and i don't really know of people using a lot of other ethers um real quick question what do we do about sig figs for the burette two or burette one so the, so i commonly see this misconception with students there is no such thing as the correct number of sig figs for a measurement on a measuring device so you don't tell a burette how precise it is. It tells you how precise it is. So when you read your burettes in the lab, it's always one-tenth the smallest mark. And so the burettes we were working with in the 152 lab, when you looked at the numbers, you had one, two, and within that there was one, two, three, six, six. Um, You had the point 0.1, point 0.9, point 0.8, point 0.7, point 0.6, point 0.5, point 0.4, point 0.3, point 0.2, point 0.1. Your precision is to one-tenth the smallest mark. And so let's say your line was here and you would have 1.20 mLs. This is three sig figs, but it, this is the answer, correct answer here is three sigs, but not because you're supposed to report three sig figs in a burette. It's because this is what you end up happening to have. Let's say instead of being at one, you were at the 10 mark. Now this is... Oh, 11. Now this is 10.20 mLs. This is four sig figs. Are you supposed to round another three? Absolutely not. You report to the precision of the burette itself. The sig figs come out from the calculation. So again, you don't tell a burette how many sig figs it has. It tells you its precision and you record to the full precision. The number you end up getting has a sig fig associated with it, but it doesn't go the other way. You don't measure, take a measurement on the device and say, oh, I'm only supposed to have three sig figs, I have to get rid of these numbers. 
you never do that. You write down all the numbers that the scale gives you, and then when you start doing calculations, that's where the sig figs begin to show up. So again, like you don't tell, like you don't go, if you go to the scale, the scale has four decimal points. You don't get rid of the last two because you want three sig figs. That's wrong. You write down all four decimal points. That number has a sig fig associated with it, but you don't get to say, well, I think it should be three sig figs because the thing is, where are you getting the sig figs from to begin with? Um, common misconception I see students say is like, well, every number should have three sig figs. Why? Where did you read that? Where did you see that? And you're going to find no source says that. Now, there is a history behind the three sig fig rules. That actually comes from slide rules. So slide rules only keep three, three sig figs on them. I know because I have a slide rule. And that's the major limitation of a slide rule is you can only keep like three sig figs as you move along in your calculation. But that's not a rule. That's just a consequence of how slide rules work. The slide rule has no impact on the precision of the equipment you're working on. It just happens to be an artifact of back in the day before we had calculators. Other questions out there? Yes, so for the um, Propacitin Pernangan solution, it was 0 0.0477 molar. Sorry, I'm looking for... Pretty sure it's 0 0.0477 molar. Um, page one, exam two, study packet. I honestly just get lazy and write down one equivalence. Um, <laughs> we're being honest with ourselves. You're probably supposed to write two equivalents of lithium. Um, that said, I see so often written in the solutions to textbooks where they don't even bother with the stoichiometry. So yes, you are technically to write, correct to write two equivalents of lithium. Um, I joke, I'm laughing because um, sodium borohydride lithium aluminum hydride we'll talk about in not this test but the next test and it's funny because your lab manual goes to like these weird it's like really like fixated on the ratio for the for the lithium aluminum hydride or the sodium borohydride that you'll be working with 
And it's like super like, oh, you should notice it's four times as much. You should notice this because that's correct. The stoichiometry is like four to one. Um, four ketones or aldehydes to every one lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride you work with. But your textbook doesn't care. Like your textbook just writes LiLAH4 or NaBH4, even though it's a four to one equivalency. And so I'm laughing because you are technically you're correct. And yes, the book for some odd reason gets really particular, like with that two equivalents of lithium. Oh, make sure you've got twice as much lithium. And yet with sodium borohydride and lithium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, it doesn't seem to care that there's like that four to one ratio, except for maybe one or two examples. So if you just wrote lithium, I wouldn't mark you wrong because if your book can't be bothered to write like X equivalents of lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride, I don't see why you should be ding for sodium. Like you just add excess lithium in, in any case anyway, so. Um, I used to know people that ran these types of coupling reactions and like they just chunked in a whole bunch of extra lithium. Page two, second to last problem. Yes, so um, for that problem, you're adding a half equivalent of chlorine, and this is to make it allylic. Um, there are technically two answers to this. You'll only see one in the key, but the reason why we can get away with just doing the one is that those two rings at the bottom are actually aromatic. And it's weird the way it's drawn, but yeah, if you do the resonance structure for the left ring, it ends up putting a double bond in the ring on the right. And so really by resonance, this, if you were to draw this out in terms of aromatic, yeah. So you're adding the chlorine to the aromatic carbon, but it, it looks the way it's drawn, like there's two positions you could be adding it in. And the thing is that that's not really true. It looks like it is, but there isn't. They're actually the same position. So if we were to kick this bond up here, this bond here, and this bond down here, so we can resonate this, so we kick this bond here, this bond here, this bond here. Now we have two aromatic rings. So even though it looks like this, you could do a substitution here and here, and they would be two different things. Yeah, you're just throwing a chlorine here, doing the elimination, and then you're doing the anti-Markovnikov addition there.
It couldn't actually be added to that middle carbon. The reason being is that it's not um, resonance stabilized. And so that's what that problem is meant to make sure that you're seeing is that those two carbons are allylic. So both these rings are aromatic. These are the only two allylic carbons. And if you add to this one, like you've got your mirror plane. So adding to this or this is the same. But you can't add to that carbon because it's not stable. Or it's not as stable as the other two. But it's more that you simply can't add to that. And that's part of the reason why you're having to do this elimination step. Followed by the anti Markovnikov is that you're trying to generate a, a uh, you're trying to generate the you're trying to put that lithium on that second carbon. So that's why you're having to do it this way. So the last one. So this one you're actually having to do, so you would add the BR2 with light first. The problem is, okay, so there's two ways you could approach this. You could do the BR2 twice and you would get the two substitutions to do the MG. You're technically not wrong, but the issue here is selectivity. I got my starting compound, and we can consider two roots. One root is that we add the BR2 twice with light, and the other is that we only add one bromine. And so if we do this, you get bromines, but you're going to get a mixture of the R and the S complexes. And because of that, it's, spec it's specifying the trans version. So it wants the trans um, magnesium bromide. If we do the half equivalent, we'll get one bromine. We'll get a mixture of the cis trans. And then if we do elimination, we'll get the alkene. And then when we add the bromine back, this is when we're guaranteed to get the trans. So it's more of an issue of selectivity. Yes, you can do the halogenation and get both bromines attached and then do the magnesium. But because it is specifying the stereochemistry, you're more gonna to wanna to do it the elimination route to guarantee that you're getting kind of this trans configuration. Now that said, actually no, this does matter because that carbanion is tetrahedral. And so, on the top, the lone pair is sticking up. On the bottom one, the lone pair is sticking down. Unlike a carbocation where you would get... So if you were to do a carbocation, these wouldn't matter because the carbon cation is trigonal planar, but because you're forming the carbanion, it, the stereochemistry still does matter because you're inserting between the magnesium and bromide. Here, the magnesium is going to be sticking... Oops, now we're drawing upside down. In this one, you're drawing the magnesium bromide up, and here the magnesium bromide is drawn down. So you have to specify. So yeah, you just couldn't do the BR2 twice because you couldn't guarantee that you were gonna only end up with this. You would end up with a mixture of eight enantiomers when you were done. Or four.
Yeah, you're welcome. Lithium dialkyl cuprates. I will do my best. I genuinely do not understand these. Um, and I'm going to have to rely heavily on the notes, but I genuinely do not understand these. So give me a minute to cheat and read the notes. Like I've net like the textbook doesn't do a good job of explaining this. Wikipedia stubs don't do a good job of explaining this. I understand that you have to start with the lithium, and you use two equivalents. Okay, so if we have any carbanion, so we'll do R negative, and it's attacking some electrophile. So let's consider. this complex here where we have a primary chloro group and a tertiary. Depending, so what we can do with the organolithiums, particularly if it's a primary. So let's say this carbanion here is really an RCH2 negative. And we can achieve this with an organolithium. It's going, what it's going to want to do is attack the most substituted carbon because it's small enough to do it, and this is going to favor the SN2 pathway. So if we just have this as an organolithium, what we'd expect to see is substitution at the most substituted carbon. But let's say we don't want to do that. Let's say we want to drive this to substitute at the most substituted carbon. Well, what we can do as an intermediate is react this with copper. And basically what the copper does is it makes this a big group now. And so it can no longer attack these tertiaries. It has to go for the primaries because the copper is just this big atom sitting in the way. So now we have our RCH2 negative bound to our copper. And when it attacks this complex, instead of going for the tertiary carbon, now it's going to go for that primary carbon.
So from what I understand, and again, like this is definitely outside my expertise here, is that your copper reagents, you would use them because typically an organolithium would want to go for the most substituted carbon and the organocoppers are going to direct you to the least substituted carbon. So it's going to basically changing you from substituting primarily tertiaries to substituting primary primary primaries. And it's still going to act like an organolithium complex. It's still going to act like a carbanion. It's still going to go for the positive parts of the molecule. But instead of going for the most substitute, now it goes for the least substitute just because of steric hindrance. And this is going to come up more when you have situations where there are two different sites to react. So the example that's given in the notes is this complex. And there are two sites where we could do an attack. We could attack here. So this would give us an alcohol after an acid workup. Or we can again attack here, which would drive this double bond up and would give us the enol, which would subsequently tautomerize to give us that. So basically the copper is just kind of a directing agent. If you want your organolithiums to select for more substituted carbons, you just do the organolithium as usual. If you want them to substitute for the less substituted, then you just put the copper in there to kind of direct it towards the more less sterically hindered groups. But that's my understanding of copper um, reagents is that basically they're carbanions, but they're being used, the copper is there to serve as a directing group to ensure that it attacks the desired site. So the reason why you have to use the two, it's more just how the chemistry works. So for the copper reagent to do this type of chemistry, it needs to have two equivalents, and this goes back to the structure of the copper complex itself. So what it's going to do is it's going to insert between these two bonds, and my best guess is that we're going to end up with a complex that looks like this. And so this may just be the necessity of how these copper complexes are made, that if you just do a single equivalency, this complex doesn't work. But I tend to, believe, I tend to would speculate, I don't know for sure, is that the copper complexes you're forming, this is the only stable way to generate them is to have two equivalents. If you just do one equivalent, it's not a stable complex and it just decomposes back into the copper and the organolithium. You would probably have to go to molecular orbital theory to explain like why this is what it is. And then most likely what I'm guessing is that when you do your reaction with the organohalide, you're going to end up with a temporary um, structure that looks like this. This decomposes to the lithium, these two couple, and you're left with this last complex which couples one more time but again my my speculation and I don't know this for sure is that the organo copper complexes you need the two equivalents because that's the stable organometallic 
Guess that kind of makes sense now. Yes, so if you don't have two sites to substitute, it should work. Um, so if you just like have a prime, if you have a primary alkyl halide that you're substituting with an organolithium, it should work just fine. Um, I think again it would matter more if you're trying if you've got two sites to select from and you want to be selective about which site. So, but yeah, it, this will definitely be if you're trying to substitute if you're trying to do carbon carbon coupling on the least substitute. Problem one, it's not primary. if I was on the right page. Yes, you can still do it even if it's not primary. The thing is that it's where that carbon coupling occurs. So that tertiary carbon, whatever you react with next would probably need to be a primary. So you can generate this structure just fine. It's probably heavily sterically hindered. But you should be able to generate this structure just fine. But when it reacted, so let's say we react it with this compound, it's going to preferentially attack this one over this one. So again, making it, we should be able to do the secondaries. I think it's when you go to react, um, when you react, it has to be a primary. Yeah, you're welcome. I guess a CU is just a typo that it has CUCL. You're welcome.
right, looks like that's it for questions. Yeah, from zero concurrent viewers. So, if you have questions, please feel free to email in advance, and I'll answer them at the start.